While the rest of id had been working on Doom 2, Carmack was busy developing the next generation of id tech. Despite Doom's impressive graphics, they weren't entirely 3D, with enemies, objects, and level designs remaining in two dimensions. Carmack's vision was a new engine that could render everything with polygons, while Romero wanted their next game to be a third-person action-adventure that had been hinted at in the original Commander Keen. Quake was officially announced shortly before the launch of Doom 2. Romero said it would be coming out in 1995, but as the year came and went, players began to question when Quake would finally be finished. What no one knew was just how much of a disaster development was. While the engine was mostly ready, development languished as Romero tried figuring out the gameplay mechanics. At the time, 3D action adventure titles were almost unheard of, so there were no games for anyone at id to reference. As tensions grew and the due date loomed closer, the id staff decided to scrap the action-adventure game in favor of a Doom-like shooter. Pushing the game back an entire year and creating id's famous answer to when someone asks for a release date, when it's done. This 180 had also damaged Romero and Carmack's relationship. Carmack was frustrated at what he saw as Romero not pulling his weight, going so far as to create a program that secretly logged in how many hours Romero was at his computer. Though it proved he wasn't spending much time on game development, things had changed for him as Romero had become the public face of id Software. He was going to trade events, accepting awards, doing interviews, and working closely with studios utilizing the Doom engine such as Raven Software's Heretic. But for the rest of id, that wasn't enough. Feeling ignored and without leadership, id decided they didn't need Romero. Upon Quake's completion, Romero was forced to resign though he wouldn't be the only one to leave. Jay Wilbur stepped down as CEO and left for Epic Mega Games. Sandy Peterson left to join Ensemble Studios, makers of the Age of Empires series, and Sean Green would join Romero and Hall at their new studio, Ion Storm. This marked the end of what fans dubbed the classic id lineup, but it also marked a new era for the company. Todd Hollinshed would take over as CEO, and id would begin development on a sequel released the following year. Quake 2. Though both games remained at the top of sales charts, it was their multiplayer that really made them shine, leading to the creation of QuakeCon, an annual convention for all things id that's still going strong to this day. The multiplayer component became so popular that it would make up the entirety of Quake 3, released in 1999. Though Quake was going strong for id, the first-person shooter genre was seeing an unprecedented boom, and they were no longer the only game in town. Duke Nukem kicked ass and chewed bubblegum in 1996, Gordon Freeman escaped from Black Mesa in 1998, and Epic Games debuted the Unreal Engine in 1999. These games not only expanded the scope of both single and multiplayer, but showed graphical advancements that had yet to be seen. Despite the competition, id were still considered kings of the PC. However, they knew that in order to remain competitive, they would have to make the next leap in technology especially as the new generation of consoles were gearing up to be almost as equal in power to PCs of the time. After releasing three Quakes within four years, many wanted to move on to an entirely different genre. One early idea was for a multiplayer RPG called Quest, but it didn't get past the pre-production stage. 
On the other hand, Carmack felt the time was right for them to bring back Doom, with a full remake. But the rest of the company were mixed. They had never returned to a former franchise before, and some felt they were drawing too much from the past. All fears would be put to rest when Return to Castle Wolfenstein turned out to be both a critical and commercial success, proving that returning to the well wasn't entirely a bad idea. Early footage was shown at the 2001 Macworld Conference and Expo in Tokyo. The tech demo unveiled id Tech 4 and NVIDIA's third generation of GeForce GPUs. However, it wouldn't be revealed as Doom 3 until the following E3. Its publisher Activision had set up a small 15-seat theater showing a 10-minute demo that wowed attendees, though it did cause a bit of controversy. To speed up showings, it used pre-recorded key bindings that the game would replay on a loop. This caused many to assume it was a pre-rendered movie. Rob Smith, then editor-in-chief for PC Gamer and co-chair of the E3 Critics Award, was quoted as saying, There was a big issue at the time because what we saw was video, which didn't qualify under the rules of the E3 Awards. I told Activision that it did not qualify and they said, Okay, we'll show you guys the game running in a back room. I was able to go back there and see it. Carmack was running around the same locations. We saw it running. Doom 3 would go on to win Best PC Game, Best Action Game, Best in Show, and a special commendation for graphics, sound, or innovation at that year's show. Once word got out that it was indeed running in real time, lines began to form out of the Activision booth with anywhere between 23 to 28 people per showing crammed in the mini-theater. The same demo would later be shown at that year's QuakeCon, but with four minutes of extra footage. Despite their success at E3, there were a few problems. During the event, a stolen copy of the demo began popping up on file sharing sites, some of which were riddled with malware. The culprit was an employee of ATI who was immediately fired. Unfortunately, the damage had been done and id ended their relationship with the company soon after. Thankfully, this event didn't affect the game in any way and development continued on. Doom 3 was more ambitious and cinematic than any game in id's history. The story was written by sci-fi author Matthew Costello, and every cutscene had to be extensively storyboarded with tools such as Maya used for animation. Nine Inch Nails frontman and Quake composer Trent Reznor had been planned to do the soundtrack and audio, but had to drop out due to scheduling conflicts. It then brought in Chris Vrenna, former drummer for Nine Inch Nails who performed the main theme with his frequent collaborator Clint Walsh as the band Tweaker. Such careful work on the game needed extra time, forcing id to miss their 2003 holiday season target and instead shoot for summer of 2004, with Doom 3 releasing on August 3rd of that year. Welcome to Mars. First time? Much like the original game, Doom 3 is set in the far future, this time in the year 2145, where the UAC has established a research and military complex on Mars. Players took control of another unnamed space marine being transferred. After reporting to base commander Master Sergeant Kelly, your first mission was to search the old comms facility for Dr. Jonathan Ishii. Of course, upon finding the missing doctor, trying to send a warning to Earth, all hell broke loose. Literally. Nearly everyone in the facility turned into zombies as maniacal laughter could be heard and Sergeant Kelly ordered all remaining Marines back to HQ. All units, this is Sergeant Kelly. We're under attack by an unknown enemy force. Fall back to Marine HQ to regroup. Doom 3 had a more deliberate pace with aspects of survival horror sprinkled in. Levels were lit sparingly, giving the environments a more atmospheric feeling that made players dread what might lurk in the dark. Many of the classic enemies received complete redesigns to fit in with the new art direction. There were now several types of zombies players encountered. Unarmed zombies hid in the dark and came shambling out when players were close enough. While most were easy to take out, fat zombies required more firepower and flaming variants moved faster. Their armed variants were no pushovers, as they could use pistols, shotguns, and machine guns. 
More powerful commandos came with either their classic chain guns or with that players with tentacle arms. Imps could now crawl on walls and perform a surprise lunge attack. Pinkies, Caco Demons, Lost Souls, Hell Knights, Revenants, Mancubite, and the Archvile were very similar to their classic counterparts, but with brand new looks. Of course, there were a new slew of enemies to have fun with. Baby-like cherubs, twin-headed maggots, and wraiths could only perform melee attacks while trites and ticks swarmed at players. There were two new bosses, the Vagary and Guardian of Hell, that gave the Doom Marine quite a challenge. Almost every weapon returned with new additions, machine guns and grenades. Of course, each weapon now held a limited number of rounds that needed to be reloaded, so players had to be careful with their ammo instead of mindlessly holding down the fire button. Of course, there was another unlikely weapon, the flashlight. To keep players on edge, it was a separate item that couldn't be used while using your guns, forcing players to choose whether they wanted to see enemies or shoot them. This facility was constructed. While the bulk of the gameplay was shooting, it was little features that made the game more immersive. From the moment players walked into the facility, you were given a PDA that showed you mission objectives and inventory. Throughout the facility were computers and terminals that players could interact with and download informational videos advertising weapons and development. You could also collect other PDAs containing emails and audio logs that filled you in on the moments leading up to the attack. Players that read through them also found codes for storage lockers all around the facility. Technicians should use cabinet code 396 to access them. End of log. Though some could only be found on the very real MartianBuddy.com, a now defunct site meant to promote the game. Thankfully, these codes have since been preserved and can be found on the internet. Towards the end of the game, players could also find a special PDA with emails by the id staff thanking their families and you for playing. Super Turbo Turkey Puncher 3. Do I need to remind you of the groundbreaking work that we're doing here? Amazing things will happen here soon. You just wait. It was revealed that lead researcher Dr. Malcolm Petruger was behind the demonic invasion. Upon learning their teleporters led directly to hell, Petruger went in and returned safely. Though his behavior was odd, he became increasingly obsessed with the Soul Cube, an artifact discovered in ancient Martian ruins below the facility. After reports of paranormal activity on the site made their way to the higher-ups at the UAC, they sent Counselor Elliot Swan and his bodyguard Jack Campbell on the same transport as the Doom Marine. After arriving, Petruger stole the cube and went through the teleporter, causing a flood of demons to enter the base. The only way to stop him was to enter Hell and reclaim the cube from the Guardian. The Soul Cube wasn't just a MacGuffin, as it became a new weapon. Killing five demons charged it up and instantly killed a single enemy, regardless of size, while replenishing your health. The only way to stop Petruger was to head down into the ruins and close the portal. Of course, the armies of Hell wouldn't make it easy, as Sergeant Kelly had been transformed into a demonic tank armed with the BFG-9000. Reaching the portal led to the final boss guarding it, the Cyber Demon. This time, lobbing grenades at him wouldn't work, as he was only weak to three hits from the Soul Cube. With the beast defeated, the Soul Cube entered the portal, sealing it for good. Reinforcements finally arrived to find Swan and Campbell dead while escorting an awakened Doomarine from the ruined facility. Of course, the story didn't end there. 
an expansion called Resurrection of Evil was released seven months later. Two years after the events of Doom 3, the UAC sent a reconnaissance team to resume research and wipe out any leftover threats. The operation was led by Dr. Elizabeth McNeil, the scientist who blew the whistle on Dr. Petruger before the Mars facility went to hell. While searching the ruins, Red Team discovered the artifact, a hellish weapon that was sealed away for being too powerful. When it's touched by one of the Marines, it sent out a shockwave that alerted the forces of hell, now being led by Petruger as the Demon Maledict. There were new enemies and toys to play with. Zombies received hazmat suits, vulgars were faster than imps and used the archvile model that had been seen in the 2002 demo, forgotten ones replaced lost souls, closely resembling their classic counterparts, and bruisers were CRT-headed behemoths. Bosses mostly came from a trio of hellhunters, each with different abilities. The expansion saw the glorious return of the super shotgun, while the grabber could be used to pick up objects and solve puzzles, similar to the gravity gun from Half-Life 2. The artifact itself could be used to stop time and killing each hellhunter added new abilities such as triple damage and invincibility. The only way to end the nightmare was through hell itself. Though the hell section was short, it led to a final confrontation with Betruger. After inflicting enough damage, Maledict demanded the artifact, which the Marine obliged. Marine? Marine, welcome home. Doom 3 and Resurrection of Evil were critically well received, though fan reactions were far more polarizing. Both games were praised for their atmosphere and graphics, though some found it too repetitive. Criticism was also aimed at its slower pace, stock horror cliches, storage codes being locked behind audio logs, and the inability to use the flashlight while shooting. The latter of which received a mod jokingly called Duct Tape that fixed the issue three days after launch. Despite these criticisms, Doom 3 did well at retail, selling 500,000 copies at launch and 3.5 million by 2007. In 2005, both games received ports to the original Xbox. Doom 3 came in both a standard and limited collector's edition that included interviews, art gallery, the full G4 icons episode on Doom 3, and the first uncompromised and uncensored console ports of Ultimate Doom and Doom 2. Doom 3 later received an updated release as the BFG edition in 2012 that included improved graphics, lighting, and HUD, a checkpoint system, rebalanced difficulty, and the ability to use the flashlight while shooting. The package not only included Resurrection of Evil and the classic Dooms, but a brand new expansion called Lost Missions that followed the only surviving member of Bravo Team. BFG Edition was originally released for Windows, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360, and being NVIDIA Shield compatible in 2015. To prepare for the launch of Doom Eternal, it brought it to the Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4, which later received a second release for PlayStation VR. In 2011, the source code was officially released to the public under a GPL version 3 license. Over the years, Doom 3 has received a much warmer reception than when it first launched. Though it was a vastly different approach to the series, it blended classic elements with action horror for an unforgettable experience.
After Doom 3, it had plans for licensing out id Tech 4 much like its predecessors. However, competition from RenderWare, Gamebryo, and Unreal had become preferred choices for PCs and consoles, with the latter two gearing up for the upcoming HD era. id Tech 4 would only be used for a handful of titles, such as id Zone Quake 4 and 2009's Wolfenstein, along with third-party games such as Prey and Brink. The engine had also been updated to utilize Mega Textures, a rendering process that involved covering outdoor environments with one massive texture. The feature would later be further carried over and expanded to its successors, id Tech 5 and 6. In 2007, Carmack let it be known that they were getting ready to work on Doom 4. It wasn't formally announced until the following year in a press release with Holland Shed later confirming it wouldn't be a sequel to 3. As usual, id was tight-lipped on the project. They promised it would be revealed at QuakeCon 2010, but had to issue an apology when it turned out to be a no-show. Even as id put all of their attention on Rage, their first original title since Quake, Carmack promised development would ramp up after it shipped. As all of this was going on, id was purchased in 2009 by ZeniMax, the parent company of Bethesda Softworks, developers of The Elder Scrolls and Fallout. As time went on, fans became increasingly worried about the state of Doom. Rumors of a troubled development cycle and supposedly leaked concept art circulated around the internet. It wouldn't be until 2013 when Kotaku posted an article documenting just how much Doom 4 was stuck in development hell. Anonymous former employees detailed issues with mismanagement and no communication. Doom 4 was planned to be a remake of Doom 2. Players controlled an unnamed person brought into the human resistance and their fight against the forces of hell. Gameplay and tone were similar to Call of Duty, complete with scripted set pieces and a brown-gray art style. Over the years, upper management was more focused on Rage. So when that title finally shipped, id realized just how little it lived up to their expectations and that was reflected in reviews and sales. After the launch, ZeniMax got more involved. Realizing id was having trouble managing multiple projects at a time, they canceled all plans for Rage DLC and its sequel so both teams could only focus on Doom at the start of 2012. ZeniMax wanted Doom to have the same cultural impact that Skyrim had. While this gave a sorely needed morale boost to id, it wouldn't last long. A power vacuum between both teams had formed, resulting in poor management and organization. The studio began having issues again, and many felt story and enemy designs were lacking in any originality. After the Kotaku article, Todd Hollinshed stepped down as CEO, followed by John Carmack a few months later to work for Oculus VR, a year before its acquisition by Facebook. This move caused ZeniMax to file a lawsuit claiming Carmack's relationship with Oculus began while he was still employed. The suit would drag on until 2018 when the two settled out of court. With Carmack gone, Robert Duffy stepped in as Chief Technology Officer. To fill in the rest of the void, newcomers such as Hugo Martin was brought in as Creative Director. Previously, he had worked on games such as Jack X Combat Racing, Uncharted Drake's Fortune, Halo Wars, Lost Planet 3, and Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric. Former Crytek engineer Taigo Souza was also brought in as lead rendering programmer. At the cusp of a new console generation, the studio began work on the sixth generation of id Tech. For the soundtrack, id sought out Australian composer Mick Gordon. He had previously worked with id on the soundtrack for Wolfenstein The New Order and The Old Blood. Initially, id did not want a metal soundtrack. Gordon experimented with various synths, which made it into the QuakeCon and E3 demos. However, the public response was mixed, so portions were rewritten to add more guitars. Even with new blood, the studio still struggled with the plot and gameplay. Original drafts made the demons more mysterious and characters questioning their origins while remaining cinematic with cutscenes of exposition. Martin suggested a change to something much more self-aware while embracing the series' history and over-the-top storytelling. His main inspiration came from the Shane Black buddy cop comedy, The Last Boy Scout, mixed in with bits taken from Robocop and heavy metal albums. Id would remain quiet on the game until E3 2014 when a teaser trailer was dropped. They promised more info at QuakeCon, 
where it would get a closed-door preview for a small group of attendees. The reveal was greeted with thunderous applause. It was later shocked to find that none of the footage had been leaked onto the internet. It was a clear sign from fans that Doom was in the right direction. The general public wouldn't get their first look until the following E3, during Bethesda's first press conference. The multiplayer component received an open beta between April 15th and 18th, 2016. However, the event was mixed with negative reactions as many felt the gameplay was too slow and worried that the full game wouldn't end up being good. Though the Steam page had been flooded with negative reviews, id wasn't afraid of fan judgment, feeling the final game would weather the feedback. Doom ascended from development hell on May 13th, 2016. It came in a collector's edition that included a steelbook case, demon multiplayer pack, and a 12-inch Revenant statue. I'm willing to take full responsibility for the horrible events of the last 24 hours, but you must understand. Our interest in their world was purely for the betterment of mankind. Everything has clearly gotten out of hand. Doom opened in the middle of chaos as the player awakened on a stone slab surrounded by the walking dead. After clearing out the room and suiting up, the Doom Slayer was contacted by Dr. Samuel Hayden, founder of the UAC whose conscience had been transferred into a robot body. The corporation had once again established a base on Mars, though this time the portals to hell were not on accident. They were initially opened with the purpose of exploring the region and its inhabitants until they discovered Argent, a powerful energy source that could only be found in Hell. The plasma was capable of powering whole cities, solving an energy crisis, and raising the standards of living. However, the substance was connected to Hell itself, and began to take effect on the staff, corrupting lead researcher Dr. Olivia Pierce with promises of great power if she opened the portals for the armies of Hell. In time, the facility became a cult that regularly sacrificed staff and turned them into demons. When the time came, Olivia took over the base and unleashed all of them upon it. The event killed 64% of staff and turned the rest into possessed vessels. With everyone either dead or shambling around, Hayden reawakened the only one who could stop her. The classic gameplay of Doom returned but was given a major overhaul. From the beginning, players started with just a pistol and a quick punch. Fan favorite weapons returned with a new addition in the form of a powerful railgun called the Gauss Cannon. Secondary weapon fire could also be added with mods that were gained from drones in almost every level. You could only install one mod at a time, but they could be easily swapped out with the press of a button. They could also be upgraded with weapon points gained from each encounter and exploring every level. Once fully upgraded, mastery challenges opened up that when completed made the Slayer almost unstoppable. Praetor tokens added perks to your suit, while Argent cells permanently raised your health, ammo, and armor, and runes boosted various abilities from quick ammo collection to faster glory kills. They could be equipped to your liking and were upgraded when mastered, with each one gained from completing challenges. And while players started with just one slot, two more opened up as you completed more. The Chainsaw and BFG received major overhauls. 
each had their own ammo and could be used only three times. The chainsaw carved ammo out of enemies, while the BFG could clear the whole room. Equipment were also at your disposal that ranged from standard grenades to holograms and health leeching siphon grenades, while jump boots added a double jump for more platform heavy areas. There were plenty of moving targets for the Slayer. More classic Doom enemies returned, but with a few newcomers. Zombie soldiers now carried energy shields. Heavily armored Hellraisers fired deadly beams of energy. Summoners teleported around spawning demons, and the Mancubus received a cyber variant. Though the gameplay was evocative of older games, taking out demons wasn't as simple. Some enemies required strategy. For example, Pinkies now had a nasty charge attack. The beast's front is completely armored, making it difficult to kill and draining ammo. However, by jumping over the Pinky during its charge, you can aim for its unprotected backside and go in for the kill. These touches not only made gameplay more frantic, but required players to switch between weapons. Relying on only one gun or standing still could result in a game over. After enough hits, enemies could get stunned, allowing the player to do a gory but satisfying glory kill. They dropped health, so shambling fodder could be kept around just in case slayers were about to die. Id gave this blend of gameplay mechanics the name Push Forward Combat. It kept the action flowing and made every encounter exhilarating. Welcome to the UAC. Now 221 accident-free days. Levels consisted of platform-heavy locations that interconnected massive arenas. If fights were too much for the player, power-ups gave you quadruple damage, quick firing, invincibility, and berserker rage for a short period. The daunting size of every level was helped with the use of green lights that guided players where to go without feeling out of place. Exploration was a huge part of Doom as players were rewarded for checking every nook and cranny. Little Doom guys were hidden in every level and unlocked enemy and weapon models. You could also find levers that when pulled played a familiar chime and opened up a small recreation of levels from Doom and Doom 2, showing just how much id tech had evolved in the 20 plus years between both games. Eagle-eyed slayers could also find PDAs that filled in your codex. Digging deeper into the lore and giving players tasty bits of information about the world, characters, and enemies of Doom. While it added more context to the events leading up to the reawakening of the Slayer, events were also depicted through in-game projections, showing the madness taking over the base and the corruption of Olivia Pierce. My sisters and brothers be thankful. You will be the first. You will have a seat alongside them just as I will in what will become the new world that they create for us, starting now. The Slayer tracked Olivia to the Argent Tower, where the hellish energy was extracted and processed. Upon reaching the top, she used an energy cell to rip open a portal, sending her and the Slayer to the Cattinger Sanctum where the Slayer's sarcophagus had been found. Returning to Mars, the Slayer entered her office where he discovered what Olivia was really after. The Crucible, an artifact that could control the flow of Argent. The Slayer had to reach it before she did in the Titan's realm. Of course, the only way to get there was through the Cyber Demon. Defeating the monster generated enough energy to send him through, but the Slayer still had to defeat the twin guardians that protected it. Upon reclaiming the Crucible, the Slayer was teleported to Central Processing for Vega, the AI that guided players throughout the story. Shutting him down generated enough energy to send the Slayer back to Hell in Argent Denor, former homeland of the mysterious Night Sentinels, allies of the Slayer. With the Crucible, the Slayer was able to close the portals by laying to rest the souls of Wraiths. But when players thought it was over, Olivia appeared only to then sink into a pool of blood and be reborn as the Spider Mastermind.
When defeated, the Slayer jammed the BFG into its mouth and put an end to its misery. Hayden used the dimensional tether to bring the Slayer back, only to double-cross him. He then took the Crucible with plans to harness its Argent for the sake of humanity. And knowing the Slayer would be a thorn in his side, he activated the tether, sending the Slayer to parts unknown. With the main campaign finished, there were other modes to play with. Multiplayer let Slayers from around the world test their skills in combat. Several modes from Classic Deathmatch to Newcomers, Domination, Soul Harvest, Freeze Tag, Warpath, and Clan Arena kept it from getting too stale. New map packs could be purchased, but have since been given away for free as of the 6.66 update. To continue the series' legacy of mods, the game included a map maker tool called Snap Map, giving players the ability to create and share arenas and levels. Doom was a smashing success, selling over 2 million units in just a year. It was praised for its fast-paced combat and single-player campaign. However, many felt the multiplayer and snap map were lacking. The game went on to win several awards, most notably for Mick Gordon's heart-pounding score. A year later, Panic Button brought Doom to the Nintendo Switch. Though snap map was omitted, it retained multiplayer and included motion-controlled aiming. A companion game called Doom VFR followed UAC scientist Dr. Peters at the start of the invasion. It made its debut on PC for the HTC Vive and later for the PlayStation VR. The road to 2016's Doom was long and fraught with adversity, but in the end it brought back a beloved franchise from the brink, showing that even the most troubled production can make one fine game. Despite the high sales and praise Doom had received, id was at a crossroads. On one hand, they could extend the momentum Doom was running on with campaign DLC, while on the other was the chance to start on a full sequel. Looking at their options carefully, id chose the latter. While Doom had been a major hit, the studio took notice of criticisms aimed at its simplified and repetitive gameplay. It took it all into consideration when it came to retooling the mechanics as well as expanding the story. Since Doom 2016 had been a soft retelling of the original, this sequel would essentially cover Doom 2. Most of 2016's staff returned while it expanded by 40%. One of the problems Martin noticed with the previous game was that gameplay plateaued a third into the campaign. Players were sticking to only one or two weapons instead of playing strategically and constantly switching. The team carefully looked over the entire arsenal to balance it out while overhauling enemies to be more aggressive and with new abilities all the while sticking to the series' classic roots. Every mission and level were carefully designed, making it a more arcade-like experience and putting a greater emphasis on platforming. For id, Doom was more akin to Super Mario Bros. than The Last of Us. After a year of development, Doom Eternal was revealed to the public during Bethesda's press conference at E3 2018. The short teaser gave players only a glimpse at what id was planning with gameplay not being revealed until QuakeCon two months later. Id would stay quiet on the game until the following E3 when they revealed details on multiplayer, its collector's edition, and a launch date of November 22nd. However, a month before launch, Id announced it would be delayed until the following spring. The reason was due to Bethesda not wanting a repeat of Fallout 76's disastrous launch. As an apology, Doom 64 was pushed back and offered as a free pre-order bonus. Doom Eternal launched on March 20th, 2020 for PC, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and Google Stadia. It was available in a deluxe and collector's edition. Both included a digital pack containing a Year One Pass, Demonic Slayer skin, and Classic Weapon Sound Pack. Only the collector's edition included a steelbook case, lore book, lithograph, cassette tape containing soundtracks for Doom 2016 and Eternal, 
and a wearable replica of the Slayer's helmet. Against all the evil that hell can conjure, all the wickedness that mankind can produce, we will send unto them only you. Rip and tear until it is done. In the months after his return, Samuel Hayden reopened the flow of Argent with the Crucible and reorganized the Earth's military into the Armored Response Coalition, or ARC, in preparation for the inevitable invasion from Hell. But their endeavor was fruitless, as the demons were able to kill or possess 60% of the population. Hayden had also taken a blow during an assault that destroyed most of his body. Just when it seemed all hope was lost, a familiar face returned to Earth. The Slayer and Vega had somehow survived Hayden's treachery, arriving in their floating fortress of doom. With the planet teetering on the brink of destruction, the Slayer was more than willing to get his revenge and end the nightmare once and for all. The gameplay basics from 2016 were there, but had been greatly expanded. Combat was much faster than previously as you can now dash, climb walls, and swing on bars. The classic weapons got a complete makeover, with the Gauss Cannon now called the Ballista. The Super Shotgun received a meat hook that could grapple onto demons for either a quick kill or to get around easily. Making its return since Doom 64 was the Unmaker though this time it came fully powered up without demon keys. The Slayer also reclaimed his own crucible that sliced through any demon regardless of size, but only had up to three charges. New tier Praetor Suit was a retractable blade for glory kills. Blood Punch for destroying fodder, shoulder mounted cannon for frag grenades and ice bombs, and a flame belch for a quick incineration. Of course, these additions did more than just kill demons, but dropped health and armor. Coupled with the chainsaw's ability to give out ammo, all three were vital for surviving encounters as arenas had less of them lying around. Eternal had more demons than any prior game. Fan favorites that didn't make their appearance in 2016 made their glorious return with upgraded abilities. Arachnatrons were armed with plasma turrets, Pain Elementals used Lost Souls as missiles, and the Arch Vial buffed its allies. Joining the fray were completely new demons for the Slayer to have fun with. Acid Spewing Gargoyles, Flame Throwing Mecha Zombies, Shielded Carcasses, Teleporting Prowlers, Slithering Whiplashes, and Hovering Maker Drones added new challenges to combat. Hell Knights received their own cyber upgrades with the Dread Knight, and cyber demons were shrunk down to become tyrants. Tentacles would pop out of the ground for a cheap swipe, and the half demon, half machine Doom Hunters were designed to target the Slayer. While these were all formidable foes, the real test of player skills were the Marauders, resurrected Knight Sentinels corrupted by Hell. The keys to survival were constantly switching weapons, exploiting enemy weak points, all the while mastering the flame belch, ice grenades, and chainsaw. Movement and dashes were vital to staying alive. Dying meant restarting at the checkpoint, but you could find extra lives that let you continue without skipping a beat. Levels were more than just combat arenas, but massive puzzles that required platforming to cover every nook and cranny. Doing so awarded Slayers with numerous collectibles. 
Each one was littered with figurines, records, cheat codes, and sentinel batteries to collect. In most levels, slayers would come across slayer gates that required a special key to open. Doing so granted you access to an arena that threw just about every demon at you, and completion would net you a slayer key for unlocking the Unmaker. At the end of each level, slayers would gain experience points towards more cosmetic extras for multiplayer. When you weren't ripping through demons, you couldn't relax at the Fortress of Doom. The safe haven let players use sentinel batteries for unlocking more goodies, checking out figurines and weapons, practice your skills in the Ripatorium, or play through Doom 1 and 2, all while jamming to classic id tunes. This stops nothing! The sacrament of this world to the great Khan Maker will be made, and the energy will be restored once again. As it is written, from the souls of the non-believers, you will not save them from their judgment. The lore of Doom was put at the forefront of Eternal. The invasion of Earth was being overseen by three Hell Priests, Deeg Nilox, Grav, and Ranak. The trio were former Night Sentinels that had been corrupted by Hell, and a flashback showed they were the ones who conscripted the Slayer into the Night Sentinels, after he was discovered outside their gates on the edge of insanity. The scene confirmed that not only 2016 and Eternal weren't just reboots, but sequels to Doom, Doom 2, and made Doom 64 canon. Of course, they were only in the way of the Slayer's true target. The trio answered to the Khan Maker, ruler of Erdak, home of beings called Makers. The invasion was orchestrated to collect souls for the manufacturing of Argent to power their civilization as part of a deal with Hell. The Slayer tracked down and killed Nilox Aranak, but had to pick up what was left of Samuel Hayden in the Demonic Crucible to find Grav on Sentinel Prime. The Slayer took his life, but the spilling of Sentinel blood on holy ground branded him as a criminal. Losing her only way of controlling demons, the Khan drained the Fortress of Power and left the Slayer with her minions while preparing to reactivate an ancient warrior to set upon Earth. Of course, killing the Slayer is no easy task, as he survived and used the Demonic Crucible to power the station. To end the invasion, the Slayer needed to regain his own Crucible left in the ruins of Terras Nabod, and enter Erdak through Necroval, the center of Argent production. Upon reaching the Heavenly City, the Slayer disrupted their ceremony to reawaken and control their warrior, the Icon of Sin. Unfortunately, he was unable to stop it, but gained the opportunity to face off against the Khan herself. Once defeated, the Slayer left to face the Icon before it destroyed the planet. The two-part battle required Slayers to destroy pieces of its armor as demons flooded the arenas. Though a fierce battle, in the end the Slayer felled the beast by jamming his crucible into its forehead. Of course, the story didn't end there. Five months later, id revealed that Eternal would get a two-part DLC campaign called The Ancient Gods. Part 1 debuted on October 20th and took place several months after the battle with the Icon of Sin. With the Makers defeated, Erdak was invaded by demons. To save the world, the Slayer had to find the Seraphim, a former Chancellor of the Khan that rebelled and gave the Slayer godlike powers. Both parts were made up of three massive levels, with new enemies to challenge your skills. Spirits possess demons to give them a boost in speed and power. They could only be defeated once an enemy was killed, making them vulnerable to the plasma rifle's microwave beam. Turrets popped out with rapid-fire bolts of energy. Makers corrupted by hell were given a blood-red makeover and a powerful energy shield that deflected all shots while whiplashes had invisible variants.
Unleashing the Seraphim revealed that Hayden was actually his alter ego, created to find and watch over the Slayer to serve the Father, a figure the Makers worshipped as the creator of all life. To save Erdak, the Slayer went to the Blood Swamps to complete three challenges that opened the way to Ingmore's Sanctum, and retrieved the Father's Lysir. In true Slayer fashion, he destroyed the Fathers and grabbed the one belonging to the Dark Lord, the ruler of Hell, with intentions of giving him physical form. Doing so would make him susceptible to death, wiping out every demon in existence. The Slayer then headed to Erdak, where he faced off against the Seraphim, now corrupted by Hell. With nothing in his way, the Slayer took the Life Sphere to the Luminarium, giving the Dark Lord new flesh. You bring violence and war to thwart the Dark Realm. But conflict was born in Hell. It is inevitable. A fire that fuels creation and gives purpose where there is none. The cliffhanger wouldn't be resolved until months later, when Part 2 dropped on March 18th, 2021. With the Dark Lord given a physical form, the Slayer attempted to fight him, but was prevented from doing so as spilling blood in the Luminarium was forbidden. The Dark Lord got away, challenging the Slayer to meet him in Imora, the capital of Hell. With a new chapter came new mechanics. The Slayer can now reach new heights with floating targets that could be latched onto with the meat hook. Replacing the Crucible with the Sentinel Hammer that stunned enemies and dropped items. Even more enemies were added to the mix. Armored Barons came with a Morning Star that when destroyed opened it up for attacks. The acid attack of Cursed Prowlers caused you to lose the ability to jump and dash, but can only be cured with a Blood Punch. Ride Soldier shields were completely unbreakable and could only be killed from behind. Shambling Screechers buffed all demons when shot, and Stone Imps were only susceptible with the Shotgun's full auto mod. You could test these new enemies with Escalation Encounters. They were divided into two waves, the first being mandatory to continue, while the second was optional. Choosing to go for another round hit you with an increasingly difficult wave for a special cosmetic. The only way the Slayer could reach Imora required a massive amount of energy to open a portal with a Wraith Crystal that could only be found in the World Spear on the uncorrupted side of Argent Denor. With the crystal in hand, the Slayer returned to Earth, using it to power the Gate of Divum and opening the way to Imora. Once there, the Slayer found himself outside the city gates. However, he was now joined by the surviving Sentinels ready to fight against the forces of the Dark Lord. Breaking through the wall and taking the fight into the city itself, the Slayer eventually made his way to the Inner Sanctum where the Dark Lord was waiting. The five-part final battle required players to master nearly every skill in the game. After a tedious fight, the Dark Lord was eventually defeated. In his final moments, the Dark Lord revealed that he was the true creator of everything, including the Father, who betrayed and sealed him away. History was then rewritten to portray the Father as the true creator. The Dark Lord then created the Slayer to exact his revenge. But his argument wasn't enough to make the Slayer reconsider. Oh, tell me, have you nothing to say to your creator before you strike him down? Upon the Dark Lord's death, Every demon vanished in an instant. 
but the Slayer fainted and was sealed away in a sarcophagus in hope that he would never be needed again. Though Snap Map wasn't carried over, multiplayer received a complete overhaul called Battle Mode. Matches consisted of two against one battles, where one player was a Slayer and others as demons. For Slayers to be victorious, they had to kill both demons within 20 seconds of each other. At the end of each round, all sides could choose upgrades that increased health and damage. The mode got new arenas and demons added as Battle Mode 2.0 as of the 6.66 update at the end of 2021. Doom Eternal had the best launch of any game in the series, selling 3 million copies in just the first month, and over 100,000 concurrent players on Steam. Critics and fans hailed it for improved graphics, level design, and its epic soundtrack though some were still disappointed, with its story and gameplay receiving criticism for being too confusing and overcomplicated. Battle Mode received the brunt of complaints and was seen as the worst part of Eternal. Though Bethesda didn't want to repeat a Fallout 76, Doom Eternal still faced controversy and not the kind the series is used to. Claims of developer Crunch, an update that installed Denuvo, and in-game items being sold as microtransactions drew criticism, but the biggest one involved the soundtrack itself. Initially, a digital soundtrack was made available with the Collector's Edition. Nine days before launch, Bethesda announced the digital soundtrack included with the Collector's Edition would be delayed. When it finally came out, fans noticed the sound quality was far lower when compared to 2016's soundtrack. Mick Gordon claimed on Twitter that he wasn't responsible and criticized the final mix. In response to the criticism, Marty Stratton posted an open letter on the Doom subreddit that put blame on Gordon. Though he hadn't been contacted about a separate soundtrack release until January of 2020, he didn't make the March deadline and was given an extra six weeks to send in his work. Of the 59-piece official soundtrack, only 12 were mixed by Gordon. The rest were handled by id's audio engineer Chad Mossholder using in-game music and tracks sent in by Gordon. Unfortunately, both Mossholder and Gordon were inundated with harassment by angry fans, which Stratton condemned. Two years later, Gordon responded with a Medium post lambasting Stratton's letter for ruining his reputation. When id announced the soundtrack at E3 2019, it was not part of his contract. His post included emails and documents that painted development as far more chaotic than previously believed. They showed evidence of unprofessional behavior, strict schedules, little creative control, unpaid work, and violations of his contract. Originally, Gordon had tried to settle the issue quietly, but with his reputation on the line, felt it was a better option to open up about it publicly. Id responded two days later, rejecting the claims and siding with Stratton. The split resulted in two composers being hired for the Ancient Gods DLC. Andrew Hultschult, who previously had done the soundtrack for Dusk, and David Levy, known for his work on the series Red vs. Blue. Despite its many issues, Doom Eternal hasn't slowed down and is continuing to receive updates and cosmetics, showing that some games last a lifetime. But Doom is eternal. Though Doom has had a major impact on gaming, it's received only a few spin-offs. Sometime after Doom 3, John Carmack received a new cell phone to replace the one he lost. Noticing the low quality of many games on it, 
he saw this as an opportunity to jump into the burgeoning mobile market. Doom RPG was released in October 2005. Gameplay was a combination of first-person action and turn-based role-playing. Due to hardware limitations, graphics were much closer to Wolfenstein than Doom. RPG only contained 11 maps, and its story was loosely based on Doom 3, with the player showing up just as Hell invaded with the help of a UAC scientist named Kronos. Doom RPG was a welcome breath of fresh air for the mobile market at a time when most games were cheap knockoffs of Tetris and Snake. The engine Carmack created would be used for the fantasy-themed Orcs and Elves and Wolfenstein's stab at the first-person RPG format. So it was fitting that the engine's final game would be a direct sequel. Doom 2 RPG released for Java and BlackBerry phones in 2009, and later on Windows Mobile and iOS the following year. Gameplay remained the same, but now you had control over three characters. Major Kira Morgan, Scientist Dr. Riley O'Connor, and Sergeant Stan Blaskowitz. The iOS version came with a digital comic that filled players in on the story. The game took players to Mars, the Moon, Earth, and finally Hell itself, though this time with a much lower level count of just nine. Doom 2 RPG received positive praise, but has since been delisted from most stores. The same year the sequel to RPG released, another mobile game came out as Doom Resurrection. It was set during Doom 3, and reused many assets from the same title. The story later served as the basis for the Lost Missions in Doom 3 BFG. Resurrection was delisted from the App Store many moons ago, and is now considered lost media, only existing in the form of trailers and gameplay footage. A new Doom game wouldn't be released on mobile platforms until 13 years later. Mighty Doom launched for iOS and Android on March 22, 2023. The twin-stick shooter was more similar to Smash TV in the style of figurines from Doom Eternal. Of course, Doom has dabbled outside of games. The first official Doom adaptation came in the form of novels written by Daifiad Abhu and Brad Lenaweaver. Four novels were published by Pocket Books between 1995 and 96. The series expanded upon the plot from the first two games and followed Flynn Taggart and Arlene Sanders, members of the U.S. Marines Fox Company, as they try to end the invasion of Earth. Another series of novels written by Matthew Costello were based on Doom 3 and published by Simon & Schuster. It was originally meant to be a trilogy, but the third book was cancelled sometime in 2009. Then there's the infamous one-shot comic. It was created by Marvel Comics in 1996, but only for promotional events. However, it was later given out to the developers of Final Doom and included with the id anthology. The short story involved Doom Guy rushing to find a gun to fight against the Cyber Demon. It's been considered something of a joke among fans, as its over-the-top writing and art have been fodder for memes. Only 50,000 copies were produced for E3, with another 100,000 reprints for the id anthology. So original copies have become collector's items going for top dollar. It was given a reprint in 2021 as part of the Doom Classic Collection Limited Edition from Limited Run Games. In 2004, Doom came to tabletops for the first time. Doom The Board Game was created by Fantasy Flight Games and let two to four players go head-to-head -head as either Marines or Demons. An expansion set was released the following year, but Doom wouldn't get another dice roll until 2016. Fantasy Flight rethemed and revised their original game for five players, four as Marines and one controlling all Demons. The only pen and paper take on Doom was Assault on Amaro Station. Created to promote Doom Eternal, the one-shot was based on Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, and performed live on Twitch by Critical Role. Each player took on the role of a demon invading the titular Ark base, with the goal of assassinating Samuel Hayden. The Critical Role session was played by Anjali Bamani as the Pain Elemental, Sam Rigel as the Archvile, Jasmine Bullar as the Revenant, 
Laura Bailey as the Mancubus, and Talison Jaffe as the Marauder. Darren D. Paul reprised his role as the voice of Samuel Hayden, and Matthew Mercer served as DM. As the campaign progressed, the Slayer would enter the base, and players would have to face him. Even if the party was successful in destroying Hayden's body, the base blew up, taking them out and setting up the events of Doom Eternal. The campaign was made freely available as a downloadable PDF for anyone who wanted to take a stab at it. Of course, much like many gaming franchises, Doom has gotten the attention of Hollywood. Word of a Doom movie was broken in 1995 by PC Games Magazine. The film rights had been optioned by Ivan Reitman's production company Northern Lights Entertainment for Universal Studios, which was later confirmed by Jay Wilbur and set for a 1997 release. The screenplay was being written in-house with final approval by id. When the rights lapsed and passed on to TriStar, rumors began to spread of a troubled production and the script switching from an adaptation of the novels to a completely original screenplay. Soon after, creature designer Vincent Guastini posted sketches and photos from the failed production. Around the same time, producers Mo Las Pinoso and Todd McFarlane stepped in to save the project but it would be dropped in 1999 in response to the Columbine High School Massacre. Id had also felt the scripts were of poor quality, with Carmack characterizing them between horrible and mediocre. It appeared that would be the end, but a second chance would come about as the buzz surrounding Doom 3 was growing. Producers Lorenzo Di Bonaventura and John Wells resurrected the project at Warner Brothers. But when production didn't start after 15 months, the duo moved it to Universal. Enda McCallion was set to direct, but dropped out of the project. Instead, cinematographer Andrzej Barkowiak signed on as director with a screenplay by David Callahan. After 10 years of development hell, Doom finally made it to the silver screen on October 21st, 2005. We have a quarantine situation on Olduvai. UAC has shut down the lab, men. We need to go up there, locate the team, eliminate the threat, and secure the facility. Set on the Olduvai research facility on Mars, the film followed a squad of Marines sent in after Earth received a distress message. The main cast included Carl Urban. That's not what Goat and I shot at in genetics. Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Semper Fi! Motherfucker. And Rosamund Pike. I told you, it's an archaeological research center. The setting was loosely based around Doom 3, with appearances of weapons and enemies like the Chainsaw, BFG, Imps, and Hell Knights. However, the plot took a radical departure from the games, as demons were genetically altered humans, with Hell receiving a passing reference to the conditions on Mars. If he perfected xenogenesis... Christ. Don't you get it? It's this place, it's hell, it always was. In homage to the game it was based on, the film included a five minute scene in first person, but lacked any of the memorable music from any of the games. Doom was a box office bomb, taking in 58 million on a budget of just 70. The film received scathing reviews and disappointment from fans with an 18% critic score and 34% audience approval on Rotten Tomatoes. Surprisingly, John Carmack enjoyed it, calling the film a solid action movie. Plans for a sequel were considered if the film did well, but were shuttered after its poor performance.
Universal wouldn't entertain the thought of another movie until 10 years later, when director Tony Giglio pitched his idea. At first, Universal was apprehensive after the previous film's disappointing box office run, and what they viewed as low interest in the series. However, they reconsidered this after the success of Doom in 2016. The screenplay was written by Giglio, principal photography began in Bulgaria between April and June 2018, with additional shooting in early 2019. Originally, the film was set to release on May 17th of that year, but was pushed back to fall in order to fix some of the visual effects. Doom Annihilation was released directly to streaming services, DVD, and Blu-ray on October 1st, 2019. Instead of a direct sequel, Annihilation is a reboot that loosely combined aspects of Knee Deep in the Dead and Doom 3. The film followed a group of Marines led by Lieutenant Joan Dark being reassigned to the UAC's Phobos base. Just before they landed, a teleportation experiment goes horribly wrong and the base went to hell. Upon getting inside, the Marines discovered that the base was crawling in zombies and only had 90 minutes of reserve power, and once that was gone, so was their oxygen. Unlike the previous film, the more supernatural aspects of Doom were fully present. Even Daisy was mentioned as the computer for the Marine ship. Much like the first film, Doom Annihilation reviewed poorly among critics and fans. Even Bethesda and id distanced themselves from the movie. Annihilation bombed, earning only 77,000 on a budget of 4 million. In 2021, Giglio announced plans for a sequel on Twitter. However, as of 2024, there's been no word on its status. Outside of official spin-offs and adaptations, Doom has been parodied and referenced throughout pop culture. Got it. You guys want to play Doom? <laughs> Appearing in TV shows such as ER and Family Guy. Even other games have given nods to Doom. That's one doomed space marine. However, its legacy hasn't gone entirely untarnished. From the moment it was released, Doom became the poster child for everything wrong with video games. Politicians, parent groups, and religious leaders have accused Doom of promoting violence and Satanism. Unfortunately, those claims would lead to Doom being blamed for acts of violence. In 1999, a $130 million lawsuit was filed against several companies, including id. The suit was brought against them by infamous lawyer Jack Thompson on behalf of parents whose children were victims of the 1997 Heath High School shooting. Thompson accused movies and games, including Doom and Quake, of influencing Michael Carneal to kill three students and injure five at his high school in West Paducah, Kentucky. The case was dismissed in 2002 by the 6th U.S. Court of Appeals though it wouldn't be the only time such an accusation happened. We are getting, uh, we were getting word that Leewood Elementary School is locked down. Yeah. Uh, so if you are just joining us, two young men apparently dressed in long black trench coats opened fire uh, about an hour and a half ago at a high school just outside of Denver in Littleton, Colorado. On the morning of April 20th, 1999, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold walked into their high school in Columbine, Colorado and murdered 12 students, one teacher, and injured 24 before taking their own lives. At the time, it was the deadliest school shooting in American history. During the police investigation, it was discovered that the shooters were avid players of doom. Harris was also a fan of the novels and a map maker who hosted several of his wads on his AOL page. The two had also referenced Doom when planning the massacre. When news of their connection with the game came to light, many zeroed in on Doom being the culprit. 
Rumors began to spread of the two training for the massacre using a recreation of the school in Doom. These rumors appear to have some validation, as the FBI report included testimony from student David Proctor. He claimed to have played Doom with the two, and in the months before the assault, Harris told him and another student, Scott Carpenter, about the wad. Though he never actually saw the map, Proctor assumed it had players in the role of a SWAT officer saving the school from terrorists. Despite this claim, no such level has ever surfaced. It's unclear how many wads Harris made, as AOL shut down his site after news of the massacre broke. Only six were preserved, five of which are deathmatch levels. The six was a single-player map called UAC Labs. The end screen and readme files listed others such as Techout, Assault, Outdoors, Thrasher, Real Death, Real Doom, and Tear. Harris encouraged players to email him about Real Doom and described Tear as his life's work. Many have speculated that Real Doom might be the infamous map in question. However, we'll never know until it surfaces. Though they were avid fans of Doom, neither Harris or Klebold were members of the Doom community, as their activities were virtually unknown until after the massacre. It ended up sparking a national debate about violent video games and Doom. Members of the fan site Doomworld participated in talks on the subject, including then-member Scott Cover, defending Doom at a round table with President Bill Clinton on Good Morning America. Years later, several game publishers, including id, were sued by the family of teacher David Sanders on the behalf of other victims' families. The plaintiffs demanded $5 billion in damages, but the case was dismissed in 2002. The surviving Harris levels can be found on various sites, but are some of the few that were excluded from the id games archive. UAC Labs was listed by Doomworld as one of the 10 most infamous wads. What's striking about the level in question is how well it's made despite the deranged mind of its creator. It's a sad reminder of the lives lost that day, and what could have been if Harrison Klebold hadn't chosen to commit an act of pure evil. Despite these dark moments in the series' history, they haven't completely overshadowed the legacy of Doom. The series has continued to be revered, not just for its gameplay and multiplayer, but also for its massively supportive fanbase. What started on bulletin boards have moved on to dedicated forums and social media. Since 1998, Doomworld has remained the largest and most popular gathering of Doomers with over 40,000 registered members. New mods have been made available since 1994 and are regularly added to Doomworld's archive every week. Of course, not every mod is just a level, but new music and sprites. Some go far beyond Doom with total conversions that swap out assets for something completely new. The earliest known fan wad dates back to early March 1994 with Orage Wad by Jeffrey Bird. Though it only consisted of just two rooms and a few enemies, it was a pioneering step for Doom modding. It would be impossible to go over every mod, but here's a few choice selections. Of course, you can also hit up Doomworld to find the best wads. The site has played host of the CACO Awards every year since its founding to honor the best of the Doom community. 
Even mods that came out before the site was established have been honored as the 100 best mods. However, not every mod is well received. To celebrate Doom's 10th anniversary, Doom World put together a list of the 10 most infamous wads. It includes some we've already gone over, such as Evolution and UAC Labs, but the rest are some of the most memorable for all the wrong reasons. Nuts is one hell of a benchmark test that consists of two giant rooms filled with over 10,000 demons. Wow is only one room with a small pit and a cyber demon. It was the creation of Paul Thrussell when he was only 10 years old, wanting to see something he made being shared on the internet. The Sky May Be is a strange one that's as difficult as it is to look at. Gothic 99 seems functional on a modern PC, but it ran like molasses in the late 90s. The less said about Imp Encounter, the better. Mockery was a deliberately poorly made map to show modders what not to do. Sleege isn't a wad, but a random level generator some users tried passing off as their own, and the second episode of More Death has been in development hell since 1997. Though most wads are now over 20 years old, all wads new and old are still capturing people's attention. The Doom comic inspired Brutal Doom by Sergeant Mark IV, upping the violence to levels never seen before. Lilith.pk3 by Anotak is a psychedelic trip in Doom form. Last year, gamers became fascinated with a mod called My House by Steve Nelson for its deep story and is considered one of the best horror games of 2023. Even Romero has developed his own mods, such as his unofficial fifth episode called Sigil and its sequel released on December 10th of last year, the exact 30th anniversary of Doom. In 2022, he released One Humanity a level sold with the proceeds going to the Red Cross and UN General Emergency Response Fund for humanitarian efforts in Ukraine during its invasion by Russia. Even major corporations such as General Mills have gotten into Doom modding. In 1996, a total conversion called Czech's Quest was given away in boxes of Czech cereal. Children took the role of the Czech's warrior in his fight against the Flemoids. Only instead of shotguns, the PG version offered weapons called Zorchers that teleported enemies to their home dimension. It was far more family friendly than most Doom mods, but it offered kids their own shooter when most were being made with teenagers and adults in mind. Check's Quest has become something of a cult classic, receiving two sequels, an HD remake, a digital comic book, and several advertising awards. Doom has been instrumental in more than just modding. Though speedrunning and competitions date back to the 80s, Doom gave them a boost thanks to its ability to record and play back gameplay. Since the files were much smaller than video, it made sharing and downloading them much easier at a time when most only had a 56k modem. It's hard to describe just how much of an impact Doom has had on gaming. It not only popularized the first-person shooter, but established network multiplayer as an industry standard, and is responsible for nearly every PC game having a modding community. After Doom launched, it became necessary to have a powerful gaming rig, and upgrading it for the latest games. Though the Slayer was put on ice, it's not entirely the end of Doom. After Ancient Gods Part 2, Hugo Martin hinted that there were new stories to tell. During Microsoft's legal issues with the FTC during their purchase of Activision Blizzard, leaked documents showed their plans for the future of Xbox, including a game listed as Doom Year Zero. However, since the plans date back to before 2020, it's possible this was cancelled a long time ago. What started as a studio founded by four guys has grown to over 200 strong. Of the original staff, Kevin Cloud and Donna Jackson are the only two that remain. Even if Doom goes on hiatus, players of all ages have decades worth of fan mods to keep them slaying. But when the time comes for Hell to attempt another invasion of Earth, 
Slayers from around the world will be ready with shotguns and chainsaws in hand to rip and tear. All right, folks, and that was the Doom Retrospective. My God, it's finally done. Sort of. I'll get to that in a moment. But first off, I just want to thank every single one of you for watching, and I want to apologize for this video taking so long to get done. Uh, there were a lot of setbacks, a lot of issues, but ultimately I was able to get over those and get it done on time. In fact, it's funny, I chose uh, February 29th as the target date specifically because when's the next time you're going to be able to release a video on a leap year? Exactly. Going back to what I was saying about it being done for now, um, there is a plan to eventually release both parts as a single video sometime at the end of this year. I'm thinking maybe around the time of Doom 2's 30th anniversary, so October 10th. And that would also give me enough time to include stuff that I had originally excised from part one, as well as fix mistakes and stuff that I forgot to include. Like, for example, yes, I am well aware that I forgot uh, Doom Eternal for the Nintendo Switch, Horde Mode, and I forgot Arcade Mode on Doom 2016. They just completely slipped my mind, you know? I was just so busy trying to get this stuff done that I just kind of forgot about them. As for future retrospectives, I had originally four planned for this year, but uh, unfortunately because of Doom Part 2, I pushed one of them till next year. So now it's just three retrospectives. Now, that sounds to be quite a lot. However, there's a catch. Only one of them is a big retrospective. You know, something about the same length as Metal Slug. The other two will be the first entries in sort of a side series I'm calling like mini retrospectives. The idea is to essentially cover games that only lasted maybe one or two entries and that's it. You know, not enough to do like a full length retrospective on them. So be on the lookout for those. And uh, by the way, speaking of Metal Slug, I am still trying to process how well that video did. Like, I, I didn't was not expecting that many people to watch it. Re really, like, you know, I put the trailers out just to kind of gauge interest or the, how well the videos are going to do. And then that video comes out. It does better than I expected. And then within weeks, it's got thousands and thousands of views. It's, it, it still blows my mind. It's still kind of like, how the hell did that do so well? <laughs> you know? But uh, anyway, I don't I don't mean to uh, gloat or anything like that. It's just I, I can't thank you guys enough for for showing your support and watching the videos. It really means a lot. The, this is a passion of mine. I love talking about video games. I love talking about their history. So the fact that I get to share that passion with thousands of people, it really means a lot to me. And so I, I can't thank you guys enough for that. Um, anyway, before this gets too uh, sappy. With that being said, let's end things off here. I want to thank you all for watching. I want to thank you all for supporting. You've been an awesome audience. Let's make 2024 a good year. You know, I got a good feeling about it. So anyway, with that being said, I'll see you in the next retrospective. And remember to keep gaming.